Hey y'all, uh, my name's Solio, and um, I'm somebody who's uh, very interested in philosophy, um, and I uh, wanted to make this video to talk about the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. Um, my main hope for this video is that, uh, by talking about it, that, um, that can pique somebody's interest and that they'll uh, comment below this, their personal thoughts and opinions, and I can engage in a dialogue with them. And that, you know, whoever sees this uh, would hopefully want to uh, engage with the dialogue with somebody else in the comments. Uh, that's my main purpose with this, is to, uh, you know, be in dialogue. So, the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism is a particularly uh, interesting concept. Um, and just how like markedly simple it is. Um, if you look about any introduction to Buddhism, um, unless it strays away from uh, uh, more number or more orderly uh, explanations of the topic at hand, um, it'll usually say that the foundation of Buddhism is the Four Noble Truths. And so... The Four Noble Truths, uh, while not necessarily the absolute core of Buddhism, is still uh, one of the most foundational teachings of Buddhism, and is probably uh, the most foundational teaching of Buddhism, while not being perhaps the foundation of Buddhism. Um, each and every single one of the concepts uh, is an unfolding of um, an understanding of suffering. Um, so, to just very quickly go through them, uh, the first noble truth is the noble truth of suffering, or dukkha. And so, this is a super basic idea, um, and essentially what it's referring to is that they're just is suffering. Um, if you get into uh, the word of dukkha, um, you refer to it as the noble truth of dukkha. Um, there is, of course, you know, a deeper meaning to that, but I'll get to that in a second. The second noble truth is, again, just an unfolding of an understanding of suffering, which is that there is a cause to suffering, which is the noble truth of the cause of suffering. And Again, it's super simple. It's just the idea that um, not necessarily, it, it often gets translated as desire, but that um, craving, to put it in English, is the cause of suffering. Just this basic, um, you know, desire for in this very, uh, this like, you know, craving for this aversion from certain things and that's the cause of suffering um after that you get the noble truth of the secession of suffering the noble truth of the secession of suffering and this is really probably one of the most uh simple truths out of the four noble truths and it's just that there is an end to suffering um, and the final truth is just that there is a path which leads to the secession of suffering. Um, and each and every one of these is very simple. Um, as a basic concept to be understood, these are almost like in the background of philosophic thought, right? Like this is just the absolute basis of a lot of philosophic thought. Like if we're talking about psychology, then this isn't even like an idea in psychology because it's just so basic and so like easy to understand. But what I would say Buddhism is trying to get at is um, it's trying to look at the basic facts of life, um, trying to look at just what's around us and trying to understand that 
instead of trying to understand all these uh, complicated philosophic questions of, I uh, pull from, uh, from some Buddhist examples, if the universe has a beginning, if the universe doesn't have a beginning, if it has infinitely existed in the past, if it isn't, if it is going to infinitely go on into the future, um, all these very like uh, deep concepts, instead of focusing on that, it's focusing on just uh, the phenomenology of existence and trying to understand that, trying to apply that, and trying to escape that even. Um, so, to expand on uh, the noble truth of suffering or dukkha, um, I think it's best to explain it through what dukkha means. Um, if you look at the origin of the word dukkha, its etymology, um, you see that what it is, um, what it means is the center of a wheel, the axle of a wheel, but poorly made. Um, ka refers to the axle and du is a negative suffix. Um, and so, I mean, uh, excuse me, du is a negative prefix. I'm very sorry, English is my first language, I'm just retarded. <laughs> um, but the point of the word, or the point of the phrase, um, or well, like, well, like what this is trying to get at is that it's trying to say that life is dukkha. Um, that often gets translated like within uh, a lot of Buddhist circles as being that life is suffering, but that's not what dukkha means. What dukkha means is that um, there is this uh, dissatisfactoriness, this imperfection, this uh, dis-ease, you know, this lack of ease that permeates our life and our existence. Um, you know, you've probably gone through life having this idea of the ideal life in comparison to your own. No one, there are not a lot of people that I really know that I think are living like their worst life. But there aren't a lot of people that I can think of that are living their best life either. Um, and so everyone pretty much experiences this basic aspect of life, right? Um, if you get deeper into the idea of the noble truth of dukkha, um, you find that the Buddha also listed, and keep in mind the guy was very into lists, um, he also mentions this idea of the three kinds of suffering, the three kinds of dukkha. And so the first kind of dukkha that you have is physical. The second kind of dukkha that you have is psychological. And the final form of dukkha is more uh, even relating to dukkha itself, the uh, dukkha of dukkha. Um, so I'll just write that down as dukkha. And so what each of these is referring to, it's referring to this uh, discomfort, this disease, this dissatisfactoriness that uh, comes with certain experiences. To quote the first uh, discourse of the Buddha, um, physical suffering is like the physical suffering of birth, the physical, the physical suffering of birth, the physical suffering of uh, aging, the physical suffering of sickness, the physical suffering of death, um, along with several other forms of physical suffering, um, and then getting into psychological suffering, um, you know, union with what is displeasing as suffering, separation from what is pleasing as suffering, uh, not getting what one wants is suffering. That's all psychological suffering. Um, but it's this final form of suffering that is especially complicated. Um, in that discourse, the final thing that the Buddha says of uh, this noble truth is that the five aggregates subject to clinging are dukkha. 
So uh, without getting into the concept itself, um, the five aggregates are uh, what the Buddha describes as being um, the five aspects of a person, right? Just what makes up you, what makes up uh, just a person, you know, their body, uh, several of their, you know, mental factors, uh, and their brain, um, their emotions, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but what the, what the Buddha is trying to get at is that even this is dukkha, even this is dissatisfactory, this is um, full of dis-ease, um, even this is like, you know, a poorly made axle wheel. You know, whenever you have a poorly made uh, axle to a wheel, the rest of your journey is going to be terrible because of how foundationally awful your, um, you know, wheel is. And so, um, that is the noble truth of suffering. Um, it's really interesting because, um, I am, I'm not a Buddhist, I was raised non-denominational Christian, um, but I have taken, uh, what I would call a, um, uh, secular enjoying of Buddhism, and what has been of particular interest to me is how Buddhism views, uh, the way that phenomena works. Um, phenomena just being anything, like, just the mere, like, fact of existence, like, just existence itself. Um, not trying to, and it doesn't try to get to anything, like, particularly, um, metaphysical or, um, overtly spiritual. It's just this basic analysis of suffering, its cause, uh, the fact that it can end, and the path leading to that end. And so... Um, if you look at the uh, human experience, um, and, and, and all of this is coming from, you know, the reason why I mentioned my uh, uh, secular uh, observance of Buddhism, uh, I'm, 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 I'm just kind of speaking from my perspective. Um, if you look at uh, the human experience as a whole, you see that a lot of it is pervaded by imperfection, and that's um, probably one of even, I'd even say that that's probably one of the biggest causes of uh, social progress. Um, for a lot of people, you know, if you look at some of the greatest movements within history, uh, if you look at like World War II, I mean, like, it's super noble that these people would, you know, go out and risk their lives to, uh, you know, liberate this continent from, uh, an evil empire, or in the case of uh, the Pacific or African side, uh, to, you know, get rid of these evil empires. I mean, yeah, that's noble, but, like, that shouldn't have happened to begin with. Like, Hitler should have never gained power. The Japanese, um, you know, probably would have done from a more uh, healthy ideology, and the Italians, again, should not have fallen to Mussolini to begin with. So, and if you look at something like the Civil Rights Movement, uh, it would have been a lot better if people had civil rights to begin with. So, you see that uh, there's this, like, imperfection in life now. Um, and there is there is this perspective of um, the only reason why life is imperfect, uh, imperfect right now is because we live in a society... And more so, we live in an industrial society. Um, and if we were to, you know, just kind of maybe maybe go back to primitive living a little bit, or even on an extreme end, just go back to living a primitive lifestyle altogether, that, you know, everything would uh, be, ba I mean, everything would be basically perfect, and that we'd, base and we'd essentially return to Eden. Um, even if that is true, we still have left Eden, and it is still hard to return to it. We have still uh, left the natural world, and it's very hard to return to it. Um, 
you know, so you see that even, like, looking at um, life from a historical perspective, you still find Dukkha. Um, and then kind of going to psychological suffering, um, this one I think is especially pervasive in maybe the first world, because we've gotten rid of much of our physical elements while not uh, being able to get rid of our uh, mental elements, and even maybe uh, creating some. Um, you know, loneliness is a very big problem within the uh, first world. Um, a lot of people uh, have very small um, social circles, and a lot of people uh, have issues with trying to find romantic love. Um, you know, moreover, a lot of people, even in their own families, will feel uh, outcasted or maybe that their families aren't perfect. Uh, and that there's just this whole issue of, uh, you know, trying to uh, be happy and get rid of these mental elements. Um, there's, really, there's a lot that could really be said about psychological dukkha, if I'm talking about examples in the first world, but I'm not going to. Um, but, uh, fundamentally, I mean, it is uh, just being, you know, union with what, what is displeasing and separation from what is pleasing. Um, and you can really see that in just any, really just any example of a uh, person's life because if you are a you know if you are a person if you have a body if you have a mind then there are certain things that are going to be conducive to life and certain things that are going to be conducive to death and anything that leads to death is naturally going to cause you suffering because you need to feel that suffering to avoid it anything that causes you life is naturally going to um, give you pleasure because that's conducive because you need that to stay alive um and so, uh, there's a lot of factors into psychological suffering, but that's primarily it. Physical suffering is about the same thing. Um, physical suffering is just uh, any physical experience that is just uh, displeasing. Um, you know, my, uh, my father um, used to work uh, in a factory, right? And uh, he's missing a bit of the tip of, I believe, his right hand. Um, and he, uh, he, he he always jokes about it. He, he doesn't really care about it anymore. But, I mean, to lose a bit of your, like, a bit of your hand, or to even lose, like, your arm, or to lose something, uh, like, maybe the use of your legs, that would be, like extremely painful and that would be uh, a great example of physical suffering going back to my example of like world war ii um you know a lot of those people probably again suffered a lot of physical pain uh they would have gone through a lot and not all, all of them would have gone home and that is an example of dukkha Next, you have the noble truth of the cause of suffering. Um, and what the Buddha describes as the cause of suffering is not um, a description of what causes the things that uh, we find to be displeasing. Um, it's not that you know, that there's just this funny little man somewhere that's, you know, making all these bad things happen to you. It's a psychological description of what causes suffering in the mind of the individual. And that is Tanya. And um, there's, there's a Sanskrit word for this, and Sanskrit's the more uh, traditional language to um, analyze Buddhism, uh, from whenever you're trying to under, uh, understand it from a linguistic perspective, but, um, I've only studied, 
the more conservative schools of Buddhism, and they uh, primarily use uh, Pali, which is a completely different language. So if anyone's familiar with Buddhism and I'm using a lot of weird words, my bad. But anyways, uh, Tanya is not necessarily is not necessarily craving, but is still pretty similar to craving. Um, what I would say Tanya is more so is it is craving, but also being aversion and uh, even having something to do with ignorance. And so. What uh, causes our suffering, according to the Buddha, is uh, with our minds, every single event that we go through, we have a certain uh, desire to move towards or desire to move away from something that we're going through, right? Or something that we can imagine um, that in every single moment... Uh, there's something that we desire to happen and is, or desire to have stop happening. And if you look at uh, a lot of the examples of suffering, you see that a lot of them, of course, you know, have an aspect to them that are just, it's just inevitable suffering and that there isn't anything that you can do about them. But there's still something that's going on in there that we feel that uh, that we actively engage with on like a more uh, psychological level than we do on a physiological level. Um, and even if you look at uh, the suffering on a physiological level, a lot of that does still have to do with craving. Um, if I lose my arm, then I'm craving to have my arm back to you know have it be put back on. Um, if I am lonely, then I'm going to crave community, or I'm going to crave meaningful relationships. If I perceive the imperfection of the world, I'm going to crave for the world to be perfect. Um, and if we, like, somehow just didn't crave these things, uh, these are all very foundational things, you can't really get rid of them, but if we just stop craving them, then, you know, we theoretically wouldn't, or hypothetically, we wouldn't feel that suffering. Um... And so, um, it's not that, uh, suffering is something that we can completely do away with, that we can stop feeling pain, because there are only really two people down on the planet that don't feel pain, and that's the dead and psychopaths, but, uh, you know, like, like, going, like going to this example, what I meant by, uh, you know, craving and aversion are slightly related to and caused by ignorance. What I mean by that is like, you know, you, uh, you, you can really like, you think of a lot of people that, uh, go through events, but don't suffer that much through them. They're usually people that have some sort of understanding of life, right? Like if you look at the archetype of, uh, you know, the wise old man, probably from a foreign country in Asia, who can just go through anything, and he's just, you know, not affected by it at all. Um, he's usually spitting some sort of wisdom, right? Uh, you know, he'll be, he'll be put into prison, and he'll be the one least bothered by it. And then his uh, fellow inmates are going to say, well, what's not bothering you? And then he says, um, you know, something, and then the fellow inmate's like, whoa, I never thought of it that way. Um... That's where um, the whole idea of ignorance uh, causing suffering comes from within Buddhism. Um, so, anyways, um, So that is the basic idea of the causing of suffering within Buddhism. It's that we have this um, desire for a state of perfection 
and we live in a state of imperfection and that causes us suffering. Um, so uh, this, this does go deeper because the Buddhism is a religion that believes in um, rebirth, right? Um, and the idea is that you are born in this life, you live for a little bit, you die, you're born again based off of your karma, and that happens over and over and over again. Um, so there's this particular emphasis on escaping rebirth in Buddhism, and in fact, it's the biggest uh, goal of Buddhism. The desire there is that, uh, or, or what really makes the uh, idea of desire in Buddhism is this idea. It's based off of this concept that um, desire is this constant wheel that just turns, you know, forth and forth and, you know, it just never stops. Um, so, you know, looking at life itself, uh, we're born, we get into some sort of, uh, you know, nice state of living, either through striving for it or maybe just being born into it. And because of impermanence, eventually that is going to stop. And we're gonna to wanna to try and get back into that state. And then, you know, maybe we get back into that state, maybe we don't, let's say we do. But then, again, because of impermanence, it stops, we try to get back to it, we leave it, we try to get back to it, we leave it, and it happens over and over and over again. Um, this doesn't even, I don't even think that necessarily that this needs to be a psychological thing that we engage with. I think it's entirely possible for us to actually be able to reach this theoretical state of perfect happiness, but I think that uh, what the Buddha is trying to get at is that you can theoretically become happy, it's just that that happiness isn't permanent. And if you're constantly desiring for this happiness to last forever, then you're really like, you're really like, uh, that's really delusional. <laughs> um, you can, you know, realistically expect for your happiness to last for the rest of your life, but not a lot of people really achieve that. A lot of people will inevitably fall into hard times. And so, um, then you get the idea of samsara, um, which is just what I described. I mean, it's just the constant cycle of rebirth, right? Um, and so, according to the Buddha, the cause of our suffering um, on a deep, deep level is our constant craving towards perfection. Um, the Buddha never said that uh, working towards, you know, more perfect society or a more perfect you or anything is bad. He just said that that, that uh, craving is inevitably going to lead to suffering, right? Because of the nature of reality. And that is the second noble truth of suffer, or the second noble truth of Buddhism. Um, after that, you get into the noble truth of the succession of suffering. Um, and it's a particularly interesting concept because you get, you find this word in Buddhism, this is a natural word that's used for the noble truth, but uh, you find this word of particular importance, and that is nirvana. Um, if there's any word that people are most familiar with within Buddhism, it's probably nirvana. Um, and nirvana in uh, Sanskrit, the uh, Indian religious and scholarly language, more or less, uh, what nirvana means is extinguishment. And uh, based off of the second noble truth, 
it's talking about the secession of that uh, Tanya. Um, and so there's a lot of really interesting interpretations of uh, the idea of Nirvana. Um, within the more conservative schools, or within the more conservative school of Buddhism uh, known as Theravada, it is uh, a lot more of an emphasis just on the removal of craving, which comes through the, um, you know, insight that you get through meditation and, you know, the insight that you get into uh, the nature of samsara. Um, but there are a lot of other really interesting and cool interpretations, like within the uh, more popular school. And I mean, I, I, I believe it takes up, I think, about 80% of uh, the Buddhist demographic. Uh, it's called Mahayana Buddhism. There's this really big emphasis on Buddha nature. Um, and what Buddha nature is, it's this idea that within every single person that there's this like um, spark that is much like the Buddha uh, that can, you know, theoretically escape this cycle and become free. Um, and that everyone has this and everyone can develop that. Um, even sort of Mahayana schools believe in uh, Nirvana being uh, ever present um, like you have the idea that since um, you know everything's connected uh, just through cause and effect and that since you know the Buddha attained enlightenment and that so many other people have attained enlightenment that uh, Nirvana is just this ever present thing just that's just everywhere all the time that you know everything is Nirvana um, that's not a concept that I particularly know a lot about, so forgive me if I've given you a poor uh, explanation of it, but I digress. Um, but Nirvana is just the idea of extinguishment. Um, there's uh, even this part of the Pali Canon, uh, which is the holy text of the conservative school of Buddhism, um, it's called The Heartfelt Sayings, and it's around the last three discourses that are some of my favorite um, that talk about extinguishment, which talk about nirvana. And um, the uh, story of these discourses is that there's this disciple of the Buddha um, who tells him, like, hey, like, I've attained enlightenment, and, you know, this is it for me. Uh, you know, I've done everything that I need to do. I've lived the holy life, and, you know, this is kind of it for me. Um, he eventually goes to uh, sit in the lotus position. He begins to meditate. He rises towards the sky, and he just kind of disappears. Um, it's in these discourses that the Buddha really describes what extinguishment is. And so he says that... Uh, there is an unborn, an unproduced, an unmade, uh, that, you know, because of that, the existence of the unborn, the unproduced, and the unmade, that there is an escape from the suffering that comes from the born, produced, and the made. Um, it, it's a really interesting concept. I, I don't completely understand it, so I'm not going to continue talking about it like I do. Um... But if anybody in the comments would uh, that knows a little bit more about this, uh, please, like, please, please do tell me about this. I'd love to talk about this. Um, but uh, within early Buddhism, uh, or what's called like pre-sectarian Buddhism, um, there's even this idea that uh, Nirvana was like the state of like literal deathlessness that you were. Uh, you found that you found this state that you, you know, found your Buddha nature and that you had completely gone beyond suffering. Uh, 
Again, I don't know much about that, uh, but I think it's cool. If anybody in the comments knows about that, please tell me. Um, but that's just what Nirvana means. And what the noble truth of the secession of suffering means is that this exists. Like, dude, you can uh, find peace. Um, and I don't particularly have anything else to say about this. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting concept. And uh, even in my own philosophic journey, I found this to be, like, uh, very comforting at times. I used this a while back, or uh, for a while, to comfort myself in my own, you know, journey in life. And then finally, you have the fourth noble truth of Buddhism, which is that there uh, is a path leading to the secession of suffering. Um, this is where you get into a completely different uh, list in Buddhism. Again, like the Buddha really liked lists. And this is called the Noble Eightfold Path. And so these are all aspects of like the journey that a uh, Buddhist is expected to undertake. Um, and each of them is seen as being integral, like just as integral as the last, and that it's like a wheel in the sense that, uh, you know, in each and every one of the nodes in the label path being nodes of a wheel, that you only really get a complete circle whenever you, like, spin it, and it's just a perfect spin. Um, and, all right, red speech, red action. I'm sorry, I have to, I'm, I'm trying to speak while also at the same time uh, make meaningful commentary, so if this sucks, then <laughs> tell me in the comments. Um, but, um, this is like, I've heard it be explained as like CrossFit for Buddhists. Uh, it's just kind of like a routine that you, uh, focus on, uh, in order to fulfill this, to, you know, fulfill, uh, I guess the path from suffering. Uh, but if you can give me a minute to write this down. But, um, the Noble Eightfold Path is, um, uh, you know, pretty interesting. Um, I remember a while back I even had a bit of insight on, uh, that. So, going back to the rest of the Noble Truths, um, each of these has an emphasis on the, uh, dukkha of the world, you know, kind of the imperfection of it. And... In each and every one of these, you know, uh, they're kind of pointing to the fact that everything is impermanent and everything is in change and it's in flux. And going off of this, you can't uh, expect that um, truly, absolutely stable happiness is going to come from outside. That's not to say that there's no case where happiness is stable and is going to last. But it's just saying that uh, if you want a happiness that you can, that is like the most stable happiness that you can get, you would get it from improving yourself, right? Uh, and so the whole uh, April path is about trying to get, uh, you know, correct uh, view, correct thought, correct action, correct livelihood, correct speech. Correct concentration, correct uh, mindfulness, correct meditation. These are all things that are, um, you know, things that you would, like, these are almost like kind of basic, except for maybe the last three. Um, but what the Ample Path is trying to get at is that if you want to have this state of, you know, perfect happiness, 
you need to try and perfect your actions, right? Um, so that's, I mean, that's real, that's really the Four Noble Truths. Um, it's just that, oh shoot, I'm gonna have to edit that out. <laughs> um, it's just that there is suffering, there's a cause to suffering, there's a secession to suffering, and there's a path leading to the secession of suffering. Um, this specific path uh, is Buddhist. Um, I might I might not focus on this because I'm not I'm not trying I'm not uh, Buddhist in any way. Uh, I just had an interest in Buddhism, um, so I might not linger on this too much. But uh, I'll kind of briefly explain what each of these mean. So um, the first noble truth is I mean. <laughs> The first uh, aspect of the Eightfold Path is right view, and uh, right view is pretty self-explanatory. It's just, or uh, it's just that you need to have a right understanding of things in order to progress in that path. Like if you have a misunderstanding of, let's say, medicine, then you can really hurt yourself with that. If you have a misunderstanding of health, you can get sick. If you have a misunderstanding of life, you're going to encounter a lot of psychological suffering. If you um, have a misunderstanding of just reality in general, you're really going to suffer with, uh, you know, facing all the, you know, injustice that exists in the world. After that, uh, you have, let's see, it's right view, right intent. You need to have a correct intent for this, you know, path you take in life. Um, it's like, you know, what is your intent? Like, uh, your intent can completely ruin um, the rest of what you do in life. Because if you have the intent of opening a orphanage and it's going to be effective, the kids are going to be happy, that's like your primary goal. And the kids are gonna, you know, find good homes. Like, if you have the act, if you do that, but your intent is to eventually, I don't know, enslave them and make them uh, work in your factory or like some awful crap, like, that's not good intent. And that's going to eventually, that's eventually going to show in everything else that you do within that uh, journey. Um, So, of course, you know, right intent is very important. Another translation of this is also right thought. Um, and um, there is a line out of the uh, Dhammapada, which is the uh, collection of sayings from the Buddha, uh, where the very, the very first verse is all that we are is the result of what we have thought. And that if you uh, have bad thoughts, you know, if you have thoughts that are, you know, negative, it'll be like, uh, how, you know, th like suffering will follow you, like how the wheel follows the foot of the ox that pulls it. Um, and inversely, if you have positive thoughts, then happiness will stay with you like your never departing shadow. Um, so, these are the more uh, mental aspects of the uh, Eightfold Path. After that, you have right speech. Uh, this one's super simple. It's just don't say anything that is going to, you know, hurt somebody else. Don't say anything that's uh, unskillful. You don't want to say anything that is going to uh, negatively affect the happiness of another person because of the fact that every single other being that exists really every other person is naturally going on their own uh journey towards this you know happiness that every single person wants uh and to say something awful to someone is particularly you know it's going to be something that is going to stop them from fully getting to that right um and, you know, humans are very, you know, like, the, the, the whole of this video is me speaking. 
uh, linguistics is one of the most important aspects of human life. So, uh, you know, to use your uh, voice incorrectly can cause a lot of damage. After that, you have right action, to which you get the five precepts. Uh, so, you know, you should not kill, you should not lie, you should not engage in sexual misconduct. Uh, you should not uh, engage with uh, anything that's going to make your mind uh, act in a unskillful manner, anything that's going to make you break, uh, you know, moral rules. Uh, let's see. I believe one of them is do not verbally abuse other people if I remember right. And so that is red action. And uh, the point behind uh, right action is that not only are people going through the same uh, things as you, what you do to other people is also what they will, you know, likely do to you. Um, you know, we as human beings are social creatures and we naturally need to be social in order to be happy. Um, and in the context of Buddhism, uh, there's the idea of karma that whatever you do to other people will eventually come back to you and you will be punished or rewarded accordingly. Um, even more so, like, your actions are the only thing that you really have in your life that you completely and totally control. Um, uh, it is an unwise decision to use your actions incorrectly. Right, livelihood, it's fairly obvious, uh, fairly simple. Uh, don't get into any industry which causes the suffering of other people, so don't get into slave trade, don't get into, uh, uh, in the context of Buddhism, uh, don't get into uh, weapons manufacturing or uh, warfare. Uh, don't uh, get into an industry where you are intoxicating people. Don't swindle people. Don't bamboozle people. Don't be a rapscallion in your business. Like don't 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 do any of that. Uh, after that, you have right concentration. Super simple. Just focus on. Things which are, you know, correct, that are moral. So, you know, in this case, it could be like focusing upon um, improving your actions, improving yourself, improving your mind, rather than just like transient happiness, like, uh, you know, eating all day, spending all day, uh, engaging with content, you know, whatever that would, might, might mean. Uh, you have right mindfulness which, you know, mindfulness is a big word in the West now. Uh, and it basically, it's just referring to, you know, you should uh, just be aware and be mindful, mindful of everything that's going on with you. Don't just go into a shell where you're going to be not thinking about whatever's happening to you. You need to be aware of that. And then finally, you have right meditation, which is that, uh, specifically within a Buddhist context, that you need to uh, meditate on the correct things in order to uh, liberate yourself of suffering. Now, there, there are a few embellishments on here, on here specifically, because I could not, um, again, I'm trying to talk and I'm trying to talk about the precepts uh, at the, like at the same time. So um, one of these out of the uh, five precepts is wrong and one of these out of the uh, Eightfold Path is wrong. I know that. Um, but I can't remember which one is wrong, so correct me in the comments. Um, but that is the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. Um, and so it's a particularly interesting concept, and um, really I have nothing else that I could say about it. Um, ultimately, I mean... All of this was uh, originally intended by the Buddha to be something that you contemplate on. Uh, this was not something that was just merely discussed, merely uh, talked about. 
this was something that you kind of eventually realize, uh, you know, meditating upon, uh, you know, the nature of reality. And so, uh, to respect that, uh, I will not be talking any further about this, um, though I would most definitely love if, uh, if anyone here uh, knows about this, has any further knowledge on this, uh, it's just interesting talking about it. Please comment below and uh, comment your thoughts, and I'll gladly talk with you. But uh, yeah, these are the Four Noble Truths. Uh, this was one of the first philosophic concepts that I really got into, um, so I figured it'd be a good, you know, good starting point uh, for a channel like this. Anyways, I uh, hope you enjoyed. Um, if you would like to, uh, please like, comment, or subscribe. I would be particularly appreciative if you commented. Um, and I, I mean, I, I hope this helped you. Uh, that's all. Right. Bye, all.